Jean-Paul Merritt, French, Pierre Ma, the 24th of May 1743 to the 13th of July 1793, was a French political theorist, physician, and scientist who was a radical journalist and politician during the French Revolution. His journalism became renowned for its fierce tone, uncompromising stance towards the new leaders and institutions of the revolution, and advocacy of basic human rights for the poorest members of society, yet calling for prisoners of the revolution to be killed before they could be freed in the September massacres. He was one of the most radical voices of the French Revolution. He became a vigorous defender of the sans culottes, publishing his views in pamphlets, placards, and newspapers, notably his periodical L'Ami du Pupil, Friend of the People, which helped make him their unofficial link with the radical, Republican Jacobin group that came to power after June 1793. Merritt was assassinated by Charlotte Corday, a Girondin sympathizer, while taking a medicinal bath for his debilitating skin condition. In death, Merritt became an icon to the Jacobins as a revolutionary martyr, as portrayed in Jacques Louis David's famous painting, The Death of Merritt. For this assassination, Corday was executed four days later, on 17 July 1793. <laughs> Early life, education and writings Jean-Paul Merritt was born in Boudry in the Prussian Principality of Nucatel, now part of Switzerland, on 24 May 1743. He was the second of nine children born to Jean Mara, Giovanni Mara a native of Colliery, Sardinia, and Louise Cabral, a French Huguenot from Castors. His father was a Mercedarian, commendator, and religious refugee who converted to Calvinism in Geneva. At the age of 16, Merritt left home in search of new opportunities, aware of the limited opportunities for outsiders. His highly educated father had been turned down for several college secondary teaching posts. At the age of 17 he applied to join the expedition of Jean-Baptiste Chappé d'Auteroche to journey to Tobolsch to measure the transit of Venus, but was turned down. His first stop was with the wealthy Nyrick family in Bordeaux. After two years there he moved on to Paris where he studied medicine without gaining any formal qualifications. Moving to London in 1765, for fear of being drawn into dissipation, he set himself up informally as a doctor, befriended the royal academician artist Angelica Kaufman, and began to mix with Italian artists and architects in the coffee houses around Soho. Highly ambitious, but without patronage or qualifications, he set about inserting himself into the intellectual scene with works on philosophy. A Philosophical Essay on Man, published 1773, and Political Theory, Chains of Slavery, published 1774. Voltaire's sharp critique of De Lhomme, an augmented translation, published 1775-76, partly in defense of his protégé Helvetius, reinforced Merritt's growing sense of a widening gulf between the philosophies, grouped around Voltaire on one hand, and their opponents, loosely grouped around Rousseau on the other. Around 1770, Merritt moved to Newcastle upon Tyne. His first political work, Chains of Slavery, inspired by the extra-parliamentary activities of the disenfranchised MP, and later Mayor of London, John Wilkes, was most probably compiled in the Central Library there. By Merritt's own colourful account, he lived on black coffee for three months, during its composition, sleeping only two hours a night, and then, after finishing, sleeping soundly for thirteen days in a row. He gave it the subtitle. A work in which the clandestine and villainous attempts of princes to ruin liberty are pointed out, and the dreadful scenes of despotism disclosed. It earned him honorary membership of the patriotic societies of Berwick upon Tweed, Carlisle, and Newcastle. The Newcastle Literary and Philosophical Society Library possesses a copy, and Tyne and Weir Archives Service holds three presented to the various Newcastle guilds. A published essay on curing a friend of Gleitz gonorrhea, probably helped to secure his medical referees for an M.D. from the University of St. Andrews in June 1775. On his return to London, he published Enquiry into the Nature, Cause, and Cure of a Singular Disease of the Eyes. In 1776, Merritt moved to Paris following a brief stopover in Geneva to visit his family. Here his growing reputation as a highly effective doctor, along with the patronage of the Marquis de Lobespine, the husband of one of his patients, secured his appointment, in June 1777, as physician to the bodyguard of the Comte d'Artois, Louis XVI's youngest brother who was to become King Charles X in 1824. 
The position paid 2,000 livres a year plus allowances. Scientific writing Merritt was soon in great demand as a court doctor among the aristocracy and he used his newfound wealth to set up a laboratory in the Marquise de Lobespin's house. Soon he was publishing works on fire and heat, electricity and light. He published, first, a summary of his scientific views and discoveries in Découvertes de M. Merit sur le feu, l'électricité et la lumière Mr. Merit's Discoveries on Fire, Electricity and Light in 1779. He then went on to publish three much more detailed and extensive works, expanding on each of his areas of research. His method was to describe in detail the meticulous series of experiments he had undertaken on a problem, seeking to explore and then exclude all possible conclusions but the one he reached. Recherches physiques sur le feu The first of Merritt's large-scale publications detailing his experiments and drawing conclusions from them was Recherches physiques sur le feu Research into the Physics of Fire, which was published in 1780 with the approval of the official censors. This describes 166 experiments conducted to demonstrate that fire was not, as was widely held, a material element but an igneous fluid. He asked the Academy of Sciences to appraise his work, and it appointed a commission to do so, which reported in April 1779. The report avoided endorsing Merritt's conclusions but did speak of his new, precise and well-executed experiments, appropriately and ingeniously designed. Merritt then published his work, with the claim that the Academy approved of its contents. Since the Academy had endorsed his methods but said nothing to agree with his conclusions, this claim drew the ire of Antoine Lavoisier, who demanded that the Academy repudiate it. When the Academy did so, this marked the beginning of worsening relations between Merritt and many of its leading members. A number of them, including Lavoisier himself, as well as Condorcet and Laplace took a strong dislike to Merritt. However, Lamarck and Lassapide wrote positively about Merritt's experiments and conclusions. Découvertes sur la lumière In Merritt's time, Newton's views on light and color were regarded almost universally as definitive, yet Merritt's explicit purpose in his second major work Découvertes sur la lumière discoveries on light was to demonstrate that in certain key areas, Newton was wrong. The focus of Merritt's work was the study of how light bends around objects, and his main argument was that while Newton held that white light was broken down into colors by refraction, the colors were actually caused by diffraction. When a beam of sunlight shone through an aperture, passed through a prism and projected color onto a wall, the splitting of the light into colors took place not in the prism, as Newton maintained, but at the edges of the aperture itself. Merritt also sought to demonstrate that there are only three primary colors, rather than seven as Newton had argued. Once again, Merritt requested the Academy of Sciences review his work, and it set up a commission to do so. Over a period of seven months, from June 1779 to January 1780, Merritt performed his experiments in the presence of the commissioners so that they could appraise his methods and conclusions. The drafting of their final report was assigned to Jean-Baptiste Leroy. The report was finally produced after many delays in May 1780, and consisted of just three short paragraphs. Significantly, the report concluded that, "...these experiments are so very numerous but less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 they do not appear to us to prove what the author believes they establish." The Academy declined to endorse Merritt's work. When it was published, Découvertes sur la lumière did not carry the royal approbation. According to the title page it was printed in London, meaning either that Merritt could not get the official censor to approve it, or he did not want to spend the time and effort to do so. <laughs> Recherches physiques sur l'électricité Merritt's third major work, Recherches physiques sur l'électricité Research on the Physics of Electricity, outlined 214 experiments. One of his major areas of interest was in electrical attraction and repulsion. Repulsion, he held, was not a basic force of nature. 
He addressed a number of other areas of enquiry in his work, concluding with a section on lightning rods which argued that those with pointed ends were more effective than those with blunt ends, and denouncing the idea of «earthquake rods» advocated by Pierre Berthelon de Saint-Lazare. This book was published with the censor's stamp of approval, but Merritt did not seek the endorsement of the Academy of Sciences. In April 1783, he resigned his court appointment and devoted his energies full time to scientific research. Apart from his major works, during this period Merritt published shorter essays on the medical use of electricity Memoir sur l'électricité médicale 1783 and on optics Notions élémentaires d'optique he published a well-received translation of Newton's Optics 1787, which was still in print until recently, and later a collection of essays on his experimental findings, including a study on the effect of light on soap bubbles in his Memoirs Académiques, aux nouvelles découvertes sur la lumière Academic Memoirs, or New Discoveries on Light, 1788. Benjamin Franklin visited him on several occasions and Goethe described his rejection by the Academy as a glaring example of scientific despotism. Other pre-revolutionary writing In 1782, Merritt published his «Favorite Work», a plan de législation criminelle. It was a polemic for penal reform, inspired by Rousseau and Cesare Beccaria, which had been entered into a competition announced by the Bern Economic Society in February 1777 and backed by Frederick the Great and Voltaire. Merritt's entry contained many radical ideas, including the argument that society should provide fundamental natural needs, such as food and shelter, if it expected all its citizens to follow its civil laws, that the king was no more than the first magistrate of his people, that there should be a common death penalty regardless of class, and that each town should have a dedicated avocat des pauvres, and set up independent criminal tribunals with twelve-man juries to ensure a fair trial. L'Ami du Pupil On the eve of the French Revolution, Merritt placed his career as a scientist and doctor behind him and took up his pen on behalf of the Third Estate. In 1788, when the Assembly of Notables advised Louis XVI to assemble the Estates General for the first time in 175 years, Merritt devoted himself entirely to politics. In January 1789, he published his Offrande à la Patrie offering to the nation, which touched on some of the same points as the Abbé Sia's famous KCEK la tiers état? What is the third estate? This was followed by a supplement de l'Offrande in March, followed in July by La Constitution, au projet de déclaration des droits de l'homme et du citoyen, intended to influence the drafting of France's new constitution, then being debated in the National Assembly. On 12 September 1789, Merritt began his own newspaper, entitled Publiciste Parisien, before changing its name four days later to L'Ami du Pupil, the People's Friend. From this position, he often attacked the most influential and powerful groups in Paris, including the Commune, the Constituent Assembly, the Ministers, and the Châtelet. In January 1790, he moved to the Radical Cordeliers section, then under the leadership of the lawyer Danton, was nearly arrested for his aggressive attacks against Jacques Necker, Louis XVI's a popular finance minister, and was forced to flee to London. In May, he returned to Paris to continue publication of L'Ami du Pupil and briefly ran a second newspaper in June 1790 called Le Junius Francais named after the notorious English polemicist Junius. Merritt faced the problem of counterfeiters distributing falsified versions of L'Ami du Pupil. This led him to call for police intervention, which resulted in the suppression of the fraudulent issues, leaving Merritt the continuing sole author of L'Ami de Pupil. During this period, Merritt made regular attacks on the more conservative revolutionary leaders. In a pamphlet from 26 July 1790, entitled, Seen est fate de nous. We're done for. He warned against counter revolutionaries, advising, Five or six hundred heads cut off would have assured your repose, freedom, and happiness. Between 1790 and 1792, Merritt was often forced into hiding, sometimes in the Paris sewers, where he almost certainly aggravated his debilitating chronic skin disease possibly dermatitis herpetiformis. 
In January 1792, he married the 26-year-old Simone Everd in a common law ceremony on his return from exile in London, having previously expressed his love for her. She was the sister-in-law of his typographer, Jean Antoine Corn, and had lent him money and sheltered him on several occasions. Merritt only emerged publicly on the 10th of August insurrection, when the Tuileries Palace was invaded and the royal family forced to shelter within the Legislative Assembly. The spark for this uprising was the Brunswick Manifesto, which called for the crushing of the revolution and helped to inflame popular outrage in Paris. Merritt was a leading proponent of the September massacres, 2 to 7 September 1792, which took place out of a fear that foreign and royalist armies would attack Paris and that the inmates of the city's prisons would be freed and join them. He called on draftees to kill the prisoners before they could be freed. The action was undertaken by mobs of National Guardsmen and some fédérés and, by 6 September, half the prison population of Paris had been summarily executed, some 1,200 to 1,400 prisoners. Of these, 233 were nonjuring Catholic priests, most of the remainder were common criminals. No one was prosecuted for the killings. The National Convention. Merritt was elected to the National Convention in September 1792 as one of 26 Paris deputies, although he belonged to no party. When France was declared a republic on the 22nd of September, Merritt renamed his Lamy du Pupil as Le Journal de la République Française, Journal of the French Republic. His stance during the trial of the deposed King Louis XVI was unique. He declared it unfair to accuse Louis of anything before his acceptance of the French Constitution of 1791, and although implacably, he said, believing that the monarch's death would be good for the people, defended Guillaume Chrétien de Lamoignon de Malesherbes, the king's council, as a «sage at respectable Vieillard. Wise and respected old man». On 21 January 1793, Louis XVI was guillotined, which caused political turmoil. From January to May, Merritt fought bitterly with the Girondins, whom he believed to be covert enemies of republicanism. Merritt's hatred of the Girondins became increasingly heated which led him to call for the use of violent tactics against them. The Girondins fought back and demanded that Merritt be tried before the Revolutionary Tribunal. After attempting to avoid arrest for several days Merritt was finally imprisoned. On 24 April, he was brought before the tribunal on the charges that he had printed in his paper statements calling for widespread murder as well as the suspension of the convention. Merritt decisively defended his actions, stating that he had no evil intentions directed against the convention. Merritt was acquitted of all charges to the riotous celebrations of his supporters. Death. The fall of the Girondins on 2 June, helped by the actions of François Henriot, the new leader of the National Guard, was one of Merritt's last achievements. Forced to retire from the convention as a result of his worsening skin disease, he continued to work from home, where he soaked in a medicinal bath. Now that the Montagnards no longer needed his support in the struggle against the Girondins, Robespierre and other leading Montagnards began to separate themselves from him, while the convention largely ignored his letters. Merritt was in his bathtub on 13 July, when a young woman from Caen, Charlotte Corday, appeared at his flat, claiming to have vital information on the activities of the escaped Girondins who had fled to Normandy. Despite his wife Simone's protests, Merritt asked for her to enter and gave her an audience by his bath, over which a board had been laid to serve as a writing desk. Their interview lasted around 15 minutes. He asked her what was happening in Caen and she explained, reciting a list of the offending deputies. After he had finished writing out the list, Corday claimed that he told her, "...their heads will fall within a fortnight," a statement she later changed at her trial to, "...soon I shall have them all guillotined in Paris." This was unlikely since Merritt did not have the power to have anyone guillotined. At that moment, Corday rose from her chair, drawing out from her corset a five-inch kitchen knife, which she had bought earlier that day, and brought it down hard into Merritt's chest, where it pierced just under his right clavicle, opening the carotid artery, close to the heart. The massive bleeding was fatal within seconds. Slumping backwards, Merritt cried out his last words to Simone. I des moi, ma chère Amy. Help me, my beloved. And died. 
Corday was a Girondin sympathizer who came from an impoverished royalist family, her brothers were émigrés who had left to join the exiled royal princes. From her own account, and those of witnesses, it is clear that she had been inspired by Girondin speeches to a hatred of the Montagnards and their excesses, symbolized most powerfully in the character of merit. The Book of Days claims the motive was to avenge the death of her friend Barbaru. Merritt's assassination contributed to the mounting suspicion which fed the terror during which thousands of the Jacobins' adversaries, both Royalists and Girondins, were executed on charges of treason. Charlotte Corday was guillotined on 17 July 1793 for the murder. During her four-day trial, she testified that she had carried out the assassination alone, saying, I killed one man to save 100,000. Memory in the Revolution Merritt's assassination led to his apotheosis. The painter Jacques Louis David, a member of one of the two great committees, the Committee of General Security, was asked to organize a grand funeral. David was also asked to paint Merritt's death, and took up the task of immortalizing him in the painting The Death of Merritt. The extreme decomposition of Merritt's body made any realistic depiction impossible, and David's work beautified the skin that was discolored and scabbed from his chronic skin disease in an attempt to create antique virtue. The resulting painting is thus not an accurate representation of Merritt's death. As a result of this work, David was later criticized as glorifying the Jacobins' death. The entire National Convention attended Merritt's funeral, and he was buried under a weeping willow in the garden of the former Club des Cordeliers, former Couvent des Cordeliers. After Merritt's death, he was viewed by many as a martyr for the Revolution, and was immortalized in various ways in order to preserve the values he stood for. His heart was embalmed separately and placed in an urn in an altar erected to his memory at the Cordeliers in order to inspire speeches that were similar in style to Merritt's eloquent journalism. On his tomb, the inscription on a plaque read, Unité, indivisibilité de la République, liberté, égalité, fraternité au la mort. His remains were transferred to the Pantheon on 25 November 1793 and his near messianic role in the Revolution was confirmed with the elegy, Like Jesus, Merit loved ardently the people, and only them. Like Jesus, Merit hated kings, nobles, priests, rogues and, like Jesus, he never stopped fighting against these plagues of the people. The eulogy was given by the Marquis de Sade, delegate of the section Piquets and an ally of Merit's faction in the National Convention. On 19 November, the port city of Le Havre de Grasse changed its name to Le Havre de Merit and then Le Havre Merit. When the Jacobins started their dechristianization campaign to set up the cult of reason of Ebert and Chamet and cult of the supreme being of Robespierre, Merit was made a quasi saint, and his bust often replaced crucifixes in the former churches of Paris. After the Thermidorian reaction, Merit's memory became tarnished. On 13 January 1795, Le Havre Merit became simply Le Havre, the name it bears today. In February, his coffin was removed from the Pantheon and his busts and sculptures were destroyed. The 4th of February 1795, 16 Pluvios issue of La Moniteur Universelle reported how, two days earlier, his busts had been knocked off their pedestals in several theaters, and that some children had carried one of these busts about the streets, insulting it before dumping it in the Rue Montmartre sewer to shouts of "Merit, voilà ton Pantheon, Merit, here is your Pantheon." His final resting place is the cemetery of the Church of Saint Etienne du Mont. A bronze sculpture of Merit was removed from Parc des Buttes Chaumont and was melted down during the Nazi occupation of Paris, his memory lived on in the Soviet Union. Merit became a common name, and Merit Fjord in Severnaya Zemlya was named after him. Russian battleship Petropavlovsk Russian, Petropavlovsk was renamed Merit in 1921. A street in the center of Sevastopol was named after Merit Russian, Yulika Murata on 3 January 1921, shortly after the Bolsheviks took over the city. Topic. Skin disease Described during his time as a man, "...short in stature, deformed in person, and hideous in face." Merritt has long been noted for physical irregularities. The nature of Merritt's debilitating skin disease, in particular, has been an object of ongoing medical interest. Dr. Joseph E. Jelinek noted that his skin disease was intensely itchy, blistering, began in the perianal region, and was associated with weight loss leading to emaciation. 
He was sick with it for the three years prior to his assassination, and spent most of this time in his bathtub. There were various minerals and medicines that were present in his bath while he soaked to help ease the pain caused by the disease. The bandana that is seen wrapped around his head was soaked in vinegar to reduce the severity of his discomfort. Jelinek's diagnosis is dermatitis herpetiformis. Topic. Tub After Merritt's death, his wife may have sold his bathtub to her journalist neighbor, as it was included in an inventory of his possessions. The Royalist de Saint Hilaire bought the tub, taking it to Sarzo, Morbihan in Brittany. His daughter, Capriole de Saint Hilaire, inherited it when he died in 1805 and she passed it on to the Sarzo cure when she died in 1862. A journalist for Le Figaro tracked down the tub in 1885. The curé then discovered that selling the tub could earn money for the parish, yet the Musée Carnavalet turned it down because of its lack of provenance as well as its high price. The curé approached Madame Tussaud's waxworks, who agreed to purchase Merritt's bathtub for 100,000 francs, but the curé's acceptance was lost in the mail. After rejecting other offers, including one from Phineas Barnum, the curé sold the tub for 5,000 francs to the Musée Grévin, where it remains today. The tub was in the shape of an old-fashioned high-buttoned shoe and had a copper lining. Topic works A Philosophical Essay on Man 1773 in English The Chains of Slavery 1774 in English An Essay on Gleets and Sea 1775 in English Enquiry into the Nature, Cause, and Cure of a Singular Disease of the Eyes 1776 in English De Lum 1776 Translation of his 1773 English work Découvertes de M. Merit sur le fou, l'électricité et la lumière 1779 Plan de Legislation Criminel 1780, Recherches physiques sur le fou 1780, Découvertes de M. Merit sur la lumière, Constates par une suite d'expériences nouvelles 1780, Recherches physiques sur l'électricité, and C. 1782, Memoir sur l'électricité médicale 1783, Notions élémentaires d'optique 1784, Lettre de l'Observatoire bon sens à M. de M. sur la fatale catastrophe des infortunes palatre de Rosier et Ronzain, Les aéronautes et l'aérostation Observations de M. Limiteur avec M. Labbé Sans, and C. 1785 Eloge de Montesquieu 1785 Provincial Academy Competition Entry first published 1883 by M. de Bressitz Optique de Newton 1787. Memoirs Académiques 1788. Offrande à la Patrie 1789. Pamphlet Constitution, au projet de déclaration des droits de l'homme et du citoyen 1789 pamphlet. Les charlatans modernes, au lettre sur le charlatanisme académique l'ami du pupil, 1791 pamphlet. Les chenets de l'esclavage 1792 translation of his 1774 English work. Les aventures du jeune Comte Potowski unpublished manuscript first published in 1847 by Paul Lacroix. Lettre Polonaises unpublished manuscript first printed in English in 1905, recently translated into French but authenticity disputed. La Correspondence de Merit published in 1908 by Charles Vellet. Topic. See also. Newtonianism. Equals equals notes. <laughs>